A big welcome to the Lean Girl Fitcast, your place for motivation and mindset mastery on your fitness and your fat loss journey. Today's topic, good and bad foods. Do you have false intuitions about what foods are good for fat loss and which foods are bad, off limits, you should never have no matter what? And so this is a common way that we look at food. We label things as good for us and as bad for us. And often this can leave us feeling pretty restricted. It can also be leading us down the garden path when we're cutting out so many things that we could actually enjoy with some flexibility or we have all good intentions. We eat only healthy foods and we're still not getting the results that we want. So today we are going to be unpacking this. What happens to us in terms of our psychology and why do we have these strong emotions around certain foods and how can we actually start breaking free of these so that we can enjoy more food freedom, more flexibility and get better results? I think that sounds pretty good. That sounds great. That sounds good. Do you want that? I would love that. Okay, we're going to give it to you. <laughs> I have my husband, Gilan Gork here. He is going to be bringing the psychology and mindset side into the mix to help us on this fat loss journey to break free of these labels. Great to be here. <laughs> As always. What number episode is this? We've, we're in our double digits now, aren't we? We are in our double digits. I can't know off the top of my head which yep. one it is, but we, we're doing well and we're having fun. We're having fun doing it. We love, we're loving coming together, bringing the two contexts. Galan's context, he usually works with high performers um, who are successful in all kinds of different business contexts and teaches them how to still perform at the highest level, actually at a higher level, while still being deeply happy, which is often quite a contradictory piece. Well, it feels like to a lot of people that you can either have success or you can be happy. And yeah, so exactly. Yeah, success isn't contingent on suffering. We can have We can have both deep happiness and peak performance. And it's the same true when it comes to fat loss and fitness, isn't it? Yes, we can have results, we can have delicious food, and we can live our best lean lives. Exactly. All right, so let's get stuck into today's topic, good and bad foods. We have stuck these labels on certain things, like, for example, the big devil in the bread basket is... Not in the bread basket. The big devil is usually looked at as the carbs. People have these ideas, even though scientifically... When you look at the research, you compare two diets, all right? One is a high-carb diet that is predominantly carbs. Another is a low-carb diet, but the calories are equated and the protein is equated, also important. The fat loss result is identical, identical. And no matter how many times you tell this to someone who is convinced that carbs are a no-go, they still when they're like, I need to lose a few kilos come summer, they cut out the carbs. I have yeah. a friend in particular who I'm thinking about. And perhaps when she's listening to this episode, she's going to think, yep, Ange. I'm like, I'm going to tell you a hundred times, a hundred times. I'm like, how was your diet this week? She's like, yeah, you know, I'm back to those greens on the chicken. And I'm like, girl, no. And she's not able to stick to it because she actually loves carbs. So this is a huge challenge that people have. And whether mm. it be carbs, it could be sugar, it could be a donut, it could be any of these. Well, it comes down to our beliefs. Foods. It comes down to our yeah. beliefs. And, and you'll recall, you were with me actually um, in Europe, in Latvia, uh, when I spoke for NATO. And um, there were other amazing speakers at that Stratcom conference. One particular researcher who was telling us about how people have these beliefs. And even when they're then shown that their beliefs are wrong, things like peeing on, on a jellyfish sting does not actually uh heal it you know that, that, was, came, that was my favorite that yeah my that came from friends favorite. that yes. was an episode of friends where <laughs> she weed on someone or somebody weed on someone um and then people just have that same thing with carrots and eyesight same things and this is a big one that people contest is uh, when kids have sugar do they become hyperactive so it's it's there are a lot of beliefs and what they found was when given the evidence people's Beliefs, when they were re-surveyed about these things, their beliefs did shift a little bit towards the evidence. But then several months later, when they were surveyed again, their beliefs just shifted 
back to what they were. Right, which is so, quite, yeah, it's quite scary. And I think that this is something I try to preach on my Instagram. And that's why I keep on beating the same messages. You can have it all, like you can in- include all of these things, but still we can feel this resistance to resistance towards certain foods. And actually often the resistance to them is what makes us crave them even more. Yeah, and it's a false intuition, meaning that I just get the sense that I should not have that in order to get my to have my fat loss goals. But you're being misled. You're being misled. And our mind does this in various ways that I can't wait to get into. And I think even in contrast, there are certain foods that we can think are healthy. Um, so as an example, we went to Seattle this week and I actually posted it up on my stories that these giant chocolate muffins are sitting on the counter and as a marketing, oh, I don't know if it's marketing, but they just call out that they're gluten-free and they are refined sugar-free. And so as a mental, you know, your mind automatically jumps to be like, oh, well, that must be a healthy option. Oh, well, that must be a good option for fat loss. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, that's still an 800 calorie muffin. Maybe it doesn't have refined sugar, but it's got honey, which is maybe higher in calories or instead of the gluten, I mean, just because it's gluten free doesn't mean that it's good for fat loss. And I think in this world of over information, there's these messages that are just like, coming over us all the time. And then we create this very higgledy-piggledy picture of what's good and what's bad and without going back to the facts. Exactly. And before we get into the five different ways that our mind can give us false intuitions and have us, you know, lead us astray, um, it is worth noting, and you actually mentioned this to me the other day, where you said that one needs to know what you're optimizing for. Mm. And so, yes, there is a lot of information out there that is correct to say that well, avocado is um, a healthy fat. and But healthy doesn't mean it's low calorie. So even though the information we may have is correct that something may be healthy, it doesn't mean that it's going to help specifically with fat loss as a goal. This is one of the most common um, challenges that I have is people being confused between the goal of something being healthy and nutritious versus something being good for fat loss. And they're not mutually exclusive. You can totally include and should include healthy, nutritious foods into your diet. But olive oil is my favorite example. People are thinking, oh, olive oil is so healthy. I can have as much as I want on a fat loss diet. And 500 calories later, just five tablespoons of olive oil just thrown over all of the salad that you're eating in a day. And you totally, it's going to be very challenging to be in a deficit. Yeah, you basically then had the equivalent calories of an entire meal just in olive oil. Exactly. For me, it was almonds. Almonds was like high protein and really healthy. Meanwhile, the caloric uh, uh, quantity or value of almonds is sky high. I I was just putting on, I was just putting on fat. Uh, from all the almonds that I was eating, thinking, okay, so let's get into um, five specific ways. And you can hear that I'm quite excited about this because as a mentalist, I am just fascinated with what's happening in our minds when we don't even realize it's happening. And this is, this is relevant here. So these are called cognitive biases. And, and uh, you may have heard the term unconscious biases. Mm. Um, Often this is happening like a program running in the background. And it evokes certain feelings in us, certain uh, intuitions. One of my favorite experiments that I I do in in my keynote talks, and no matter where in the world I've asked this particular question, I've presented in over 40 countries for people across the board, different industries, different types of groups, but reliably I get the same response with this particular question, no matter who they are. I've even asked this to people who are in the medical field, who are uh, in insurance and all that. And the question is this. What do you think happens more often in the world? People dying of, and here are two options. Number one is stomach cancer. So not every type of cancer, just specifically stomach cancer. Or number two, car accidents with two or more vehicles. Now, I know that you know the answer to this because you've asked me, uh, you've heard me say it before. But uh, if you're listening to this, think of what you intuitively feel the answer is. Stomach cancer or car accident. Because no matter where in the world I've asked this question, 95, I'd even say 97% of people in every single audience, when I get them all to call out their answer, says car accidents. Right. But the real answer is actually stomach cancer. It's a false intuition. We're, we're, now, you didn't have the data. So, so when I say to you, which one do you feel is the right answer? It's exactly that. We just have a feeling and an intuition. Now, why... 
do you think that why do most people think that it's car accidents? Because they obviously are more exposed to that. They hear about it more or they actually visibly see, oh, there's an accident on the road. And so that gives them the intuition. And I think where this is relevant when it comes to fat loss is let's say you head to your favorite mug and bean restaurant or actually any restaurant and you have a look at the menu and what do you think would be the healthiest option? The salad obviously. And that's your intuition, right? Salads are healthy. They're good for fat loss. When you break it down, adding on all of the salad dressing, the nuts, the seeds, the feta, the whatever else is in your salad, that could be way over a thousand calories. When you look at the burger, you're thinking, oh, hell no, can't have a burger. That's definitely not good for me. That's definitely not good for fat loss, but the burger could be sitting at around 500 calories. Yeah, so look, and kudos to Mug and Bean, by the way, because they do actually give the, the <laughs> kilojoules the kilojoules on there and divide that by four to get the calories. Um, but uh, so if you had the data in front of you, like if there's a menu and it's got the, exactly. the data there, then you can make an informed decision. But when, But in the absence of data, we tend to go with what we feel and right. what we feel is guided by what this is called the availability heuristic now a heuristic is a mental shortcuts our brains take that helps us to make um judgments and decisions quickly and we're using these heuristics all the time it's like a, a rule of thumb that our that our brains take now the this is called the availability heuristic that um, a piece of information that is more easily available to come to mind. So something like with car accidents, we feel that way because we've seen cars the whole time, we've heard about car accidents, we've maybe been in one ourselves. And so it's more easily available for our mind to think of uh, car accidents and therefore gives us the intuition that that is what happens more often. So to your example of salads, if you have heard lots of people saying, uh, or so, even just somebody recently saying that salads uh, are really great for fat loss. Um, or if you've read an article or you watched a video about healthy salads, if it's easier for your mind to bring that up, it's going to give you the intuition that salads are good. But then you're not going to have the data of what's actually, what is the caloric value of that salad that you're yes. going to have. Which is why I always say go back to the science understand how many calories are in that which is essentially the data once you have the data your decision is a lot easier to make yeah and salads is like a big recipe but just take even single ingredients like we mentioned like avos you maybe watched a video where somebody is saying here's a great salad for fat loss and then they're putting avo or it's an avo on toast or, a, yes. or the people saying oh this is really healthy and then so it's easy for our minds to give us that intuition that this is a safe food or a good food or a bad food. Yes. It can be happen either way. Yes. Okay, I love that one. All right, so and uh, let's move on to number two. Yes, but firstly, the practical advice okay. uh, to, to mitigate that is to just get information from diverse sources. So that you actually, so that you're not just uh, getting a false intuition based on what you have only seen recently. Mm. Study the papers. Uh, follow you. I mean, I, if if you're watching this and you do not follow Angie <laughs> at the Lean Girl on Instagram, um, then you're just not understanding the science. Or maybe you're understanding it from other places. But you always share the latest research, the latest science, um, and I think it's really important for people to really understand. Uh, a diverse uh, array of information about all foods. I think with social media as well, there's a bit of a danger with the algorithm. So once you start watching all of these weird doctors with their little recipes for fat loss and fear mongering around these foods, never eat this palm oil or this sugar or this whatever, um, you know, often then you go down that rabbit hole and then that's all that you see. So I think that that's an important one to actually look at who are the people that you believe and trust in and that are looking at the data and know how to unpack that and simplify it for you so that you can understand it. Yes. And that leads us into our second uh, cognitive bias because we're talking about get, get a diverse range of information from places. But we do this thing with our minds or our mind does this thing to us rather where once we've already formed a belief about something, we tend to only pay attention to information that validates that our belief is correct. This mm -hmm. is called confirmation bias. Yes, I've heard of this one for sure. Yes. Yeah. So then what lands up happening is if I believe this, and especially if I'm telling other people that this is true, because we always love to share the advice, still the latest things that we've heard. And if we're doing certain things, then we just want to feel, or should I say our ego wants to feel like 
it's validated. Like we're, we're doing the right thing. We know what we're doing. We're feeling in control because we always want to feel safe and in control. Um, and so we may land up seeing something come up that suddenly says, whatever you do, don't eat avos for fat loss. But if I eat my avo every single day, I might immediately think to myself, oh no, or it's something around sweeteners or about sugar or depending on what it is, uh, we may have different emotional reactions. We just got to be aware of the fact that our mind typically wants, it seeks in, uh, information that will confirm. confirm or validate our existing beliefs. Yes. I think that that is so easy to do as well. You could pretty much Google anything and say, you know, give me five reasons why Avo is fantastic for fat loss. Give me re five reasons why it's not. And so no, no matter which way you go, often you can find reasons for both. And it, it's very easy to be following the people that align with the things we already believe and sort of just completely dismiss any other opinion. And I think that th there's a danger in that. And actually just to be aware to say, okay, without it, uh, having an emotional reaction here, how can I explore this? This is interesting. Maybe there is another perspective. And Often, it is somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I mean, this comes back to what you were saying about um, carbohydrates. Because there are many people out there. If you're looking for evidence to show you that you should not have carbohydrates, you, there's lots of people who will tell you that they lost lots of weight without carbohydrates. And there's lots of things. And we know the science of it is that they were just in a calorie deficit, right? Yes. It's not to say carbohydrates is the, is the evil thing. But there is evidence that you could find on both sides and you will just naturally gravitate towards that. And, and, and the algorithms, like you say, will keep on serving that to you. So again, it's just keep that diverse um, spectrum of data, of information, of learnings, of research coming in. And be open to changing your mind. That is something I've learned when it comes to research and why I never feel personally attacked by anyone that has a different opinion to me because I actually do. Most of the time, it's not even my opinion. It's just something that I've learned, what the researchers said, and I am at any point happy to change my mind. If there's new research that comes out, it's not that I stand for sweetener. And if people disagree with me that it's not about me, you know, yeah. it's about what the research says. So at any point, I'll be like, okay, well, clearly there's new info. And so my opinion has changed on that. Exactly. And that's why I love, you know, you're a scientist, really. You have a scientific approach, which is you look at the data and you're willing to change your mind. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. Uh, Adam Grant uh, has a great book called um, Think Again. And he says, we become the preacher, we become the prosecutor, we become the judge. Um, but the best uh, stance to take is the scientist. Mm. And, um, and that is the best approach, absolutely. Mm. So we've spoken about um, the availability heuristic that gives us a false intuition. We've spoken about confirmation bias. Um, and the third one is called the anchoring bias. Mm -hmm. And what this is, and I remember this, let me give this example. I know that when I was in primary school, and in fact, it still happens when we're adults, but when I was in primary school and two of my friends had a fight and I wasn't there, the first friend to come to me and tell me what happened, the fact that I heard their version first just naturally made it more persuasive to me. That even when I heard the other version, it just, I, it would feel more, I'd feel more drawn to the to believing even if i thought i was being objective mm -hmm. but generally speaking the anchoring bias is that the first piece of information that that we get anchors our belief anchors our sense our intuition that that is the truth mm -hmm. and this is why when we were talking about that nato uh, talk that we that we saw at the nato stratcom is that our beliefs just tend to come back to where it was anchored to begin with and it actually takes more effort to unbelieve something yes. than it takes to believe it when we're first given it. So how does that apply to you? And I think in a fat loss context as well, especially if we have seen some kind of result, thinking it was cutting out carbs that got us the result, even once we are faced with the science to say, actually, it was because I'm in a calorie deficit, secretly, we can still have that silent belief inside that's saying, oh, no, it was the carbs, you know, let's try that again. And so I think we do so easily revert to things that we think worked as well, because that was almost a confirmation of that, regardless of what new information we are presented with. Yes, definitely. And... Um... It's so just, how do we how do we how do we sort of mitigate that? Just and just follow Ange, and I'm going to beat it into you <laughs> every day. <laughs> exactly. 
Well, the way to mitigate this is just to focus on knowing what the nutritional facts are for every food instead of just looking at the front labels. You know, when, when, there's, uh, when there's a label or there's an article or there's something that just gives you information at first about a certain food, a certain product or first, a certain food type, just know that you want to look a little bit deeper into it and keep yourself open again to changing your mind and not being so drawn to just the first thing. Just that awareness alone will already help us to, uh, to mitigate that. If there's one skill... I could give people it would be to accurately read a nutritional label and actually look at what counts when it comes to fat loss because we can see everything on the on the front be like guilt free gluten free sugar free and actually the nutritional information is telling us a different story so exactly. if you don't yet know how to do that I have got lots of videos on YouTube and on my Instagram so please check them out um okay yeah we so yeah. you don't want to be you don't want to be a, a victim to marketing, you know. So oh, now marketing. suddenly there's all this marketing that says how bad sweeteners are, and now it all of a sudden, you know, you were having sugar, but now you heard something bad about sweeteners, and now you don't want to touch sweeteners. But yeah. I know that all I know that there actually isn't much research that backs that up. You have to have like. I don't know what I don't know how many kilograms. It's of an insane a day amount. To... Um, yeah, just a note on that because it's always a, a question that I get around sweetener. And the World Health Organization came out with a new categorization of sweetener, putting it in the same category as some carcinogenic foods, basically. However, the quantity is very important. So the amount you could humanly not consume as much as would be dangerous for you and other things on that list are foods that people eat without a blink one of them being steak so um again just because something has been categorized but you don't really look into the research there was a big hoo-ha lots on social media and again it's that little bit of information that just gives you an intuition where when you really look at the detail it's right. not anything significant. Right. So there's certain contexts around it and everything, but we oversimplify things. Correct. Um, and, and then that becomes a false intuition. All right. So um, the fourth uh, cognitive bias is called the bandwagon effect. That we think that if something is very popular and lots of people are doing Trendy. it, then chances are that it's true. Now, our brain in evolutionary terms has done this because if we were to try and figure out if something is good or bad or right or wrong or dangerous or safe, we would be trying to analyze everything ourselves or trial and error. We're like We would never get off the starting block in life. One of the reasons why we have as humans evolved and, and flourished as a species is because we can do things like communicate with each other with things like stories and we can stuff that other animals can't do. And part of that ability is to be able to share with people what we think about something, what our story is about something, what our experience is. And we have grown really good at knowing that, okay, well, this is another heuristic that our brains take, that if lots of other people think that this is good or this is true or this is safe, chances are that it is. Yes. And yet we can also be led astray by that as well. So we don't want to get on the bandwagon. Oh, I mean, when it comes to diets, I think trend is massive. Back in the day, it used to be a celebrity that everyone would be following their diet that got them super skinny for a specific movie. And now with social media, it's influencers, you know, that are guiding the trends of diets. And, you know, I think about two years ago when the documentary came out around being plant based, that was also, do you remember how many people were yeah. suddenly plant based, not having you yeah. know, a piece of meat for months? Um, and so there's so many things that guide these trends. And that's what I also love about the science is I think it's... It, in a way, it is not, it's never, um, it doesn't change so drastically. There's always the fundamentals and it's always the fundamentals that work. And so you don't fall captive to all of these marketing and all of the trends and all of the nonsense. You just stick to your strategy and get better at following it. Exactly. So just because you hear lots of friends saying that they want to try this thing does not mean that it's healthy for you. It does not mean that it's good. It could be a certain diet. It could be a certain food. Suddenly there's this new super health food. That all these fads. So the bandwagon effect is really important to become aware of. All right. And last but not least. Right. Last but not least is called the naturalistic fallacy, which is where if we think that if something is natural, we've seen on front labels, things saying organic, as an Ooh, example, yes. suddenly we think that it is healthy or that it is good for fat loss. Right. But that's just simply not true. We know lots of things that are organic or that are natural, that aren't necessarily healthy to have in lots of in high quantities. But in terms of fat loss, we also know lots of healthy stuff that genuinely is healthy. 
But when we overdo it, or when we have it, we've got to be aware that it's high in uh, calories. Yeah, it's still high in calories, exactly. And that's what's important for fat loss. And I, I often see this, and, and actually a lot of health foods, even if they are minimally processed, for example, they actually are very high in calories because they use other ingredients other than your traditional processed sugars and that to actually make the food taste good. So often they're higher in calories than, okay, instead of having this superfood health bar for 400 calories that actually didn't really satisfy you, you could have had the little donut from, um, is it the, it's a Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kremes, like the traditional glazed donut, FYI, is only 200 calories. So you could totally have that donut if that's what you were craving. Um, and then you could move on and you would be totally fine. But instead, we go and have the superfood bar. And actually, in terms of our fat loss goal, if you look scientifically, having the donut would have got you better, a better fat loss result. Yeah, like these tiny little bars that aren't even that filling, but they're like 350 kels. I'd rather have that. the 200 kel donut. For me, it's oat milk. Like there are certain oat milks out there that I would rather just have my low-fat milk cappuccino and just have proper milk than yes. to have the oat milk that's actually the same or higher calorie yes the milks the milks are um certainly leading us astray <laughs> <laughs> these days that milk lab damn it exactly it does taste so good and creamy so those are the five the five so if i just rattle them off by name again there is the availability heuristic which is that if something, if we've read something a lot or recently, it gives us a false intuition. There is confirmation bias that we seek information that confirms what we already believe and therefore we stop uh, the ability to learn. We limit our ability to, to change our minds. Um, the next one is called the anchoring bias, which is the first thing that we hear. We tend to believe even if it's not true. The bandwagon effect that if lots of people believe something, then it must be true. Uh, and lastly, the naturalistic fallacy, which is that just because something says on the front label, organic or natural that it's good for fat loss or that it's even healthy we need to um be, get into the science i really loved those five cognitive biases and i can see how they are so prevalent when it comes to fat loss and such a good way to check in with ourselves and being like what are these intuitions that are driving our uh, behaviors that are actually bullshit to put be put frankly so we love to make this practical we want each episode to have you walk away with a new tool in your toolbox so what we want you to do here is firstly check your sources be sure that you are following people that are backed by science and you're not just making choices based out of some kind of weird feeling that you have in your stomach or in your heart and then Secondly, just beef up on those skills. How do you read a nutritional label? How is it that you can get to the facts and then make choices because of that? And I think from an emotional and mental perspective as well, to have that awareness around what am I basing my choices off of here? Is it facts or is it just something that I've picked up over the years from an article that I've read, from stuff that I'm seeing on social media, or is this really the truth? And perhaps there are a few things that you want to check yourself and be like, maybe I need to rethink that. Yeah. And just know what you're optimizing for. So yes, and something may be yes, healthy, but if your goal absolutely. is fat loss, know that calories is the thing that you want to be tracking yes. and uh, let that guide you. Yes. Because I think so many of us, we feel like we're doing so well by making good choices, by making healthy choices. But unfortunately, that doesn't always lead to fat loss. And that can be really frustrating. Yeah. So if that's something that you've been struggling with, if you feel like, damn, and I'm being so healthy, but I'm not getting a result, this would be a good time to check in on that. Yeah. And then lastly, be cautious of jumping on the diet bandwagons. When we see these new opportunities, these new ideas floating around on the internet that all your favorite influencers are hopping onto, please be cautious of this and be aware that this is a very common behavior of us. We're seeing what everyone else is doing and then we think that that's the way to go. Go back to your foundations, go back to the science. This is always going to be the best bet. So I hope that this gave you some insight. I hope it deconstructed what's often happening in our minds when we are labeling food good versus bad and I hope it's given you a bit of permission to enjoy all the foods with some flexibility understanding that there's definitely place for healthy nutritious foods and there's also place for a little Krispy Kreme donut here and there if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a comment. We love to hear from you. We love to know what resonated with you. And I really hope that we have created just a little shift in your mindset here today. Thank you, babe, for joining us here and bringing all of your mindset and motivation tools into the mix. 
Please tune in again next week, same place, same time, where we are going to be talking about that feeling we get at the end of the year where we are just tired, we are mentally drained, and we feel like giving up. How do we navigate this? Is it time to just throw in the towel and say, you know what, we're going to try again next year? Or is there a secret strategy to actually pushing through and ending the year strong? We will see you back here next week where we unpack this. Thanks for tuning in and ciao for now.